the switch of a dial. Broadcasting. Brings you tragedy, comedy, entertainment, information, education. A whole world at your command. But there are stories behind... Podcasting. Stories behind your favorite programs and favorite personalities and people you never hear of. Stories as amusing, dramatic, and interesting as any make-believe stories you hear on the air. And that's what we give you. The human interest, the glamour, the tragedy, the comedy, and information that are... The Soul of Detroit! Now, presenting a man whose name has been a symbol of the best in broadcasting since the beginning of broadcasting, M.L. Elric. You asked it to ride your truck, you're out of my face. It's gone. What are you doing? That is not paid for by them. That is paid for by the people of Detroit. You are qualified, M.L. I'm not qualified for this job. Let me tell you something. You want to go right now? Okay? You want to go right now, well, thank you. I, I I appreciate that very kind applause. It's of course uh, <laughs> all earned, but uh, thank you, thank you so much, thank you much. Uh, appreciate it's, it. Uh, to be described as a smattering. Well, it's it's you know respectful. It's a golf clap. So, <laughs> and what could go wrong with golfing unless maybe somebody dies on the road in front of I you when know. you're late to make the uh, tournament and you have to drive around everybody and uh, yeah, it's really really pretty bad. So, so we just before we came on the air, I was I was ranting. Hey, kids, it's your old pal Emma, <laughs> about everybody who wants to work from home and how there's we're missing something. You know, there should be a collaborative spirit in the workplace. You should want to interact with other people, unless you're staying at home to listen to a podcast, in which case you get a pass. And get off my lawn. We actually encourage that. <laughs> ah, but, get off my lawn. But this whole notion of uh, I'm more productive at home, I can do more things from my home. I really, fact, yes, really, really, yes, really. Oh yeah, you you can cover a game from your home. You used to get fired for doing stuff like that. Let me let me let me, let me give you an example. Oh, here we go. Oh, young go. folks, and uh, and I see this with my own kids and lots of friends, and just talking to other other people. Plus, I've read stats. But just think, I don't know if your daughters do this. Got some not. books. My my, uh, <laughs> my oldest son. And he's not alone among this generation. Mark maybe even likes to do this. I don't know. He, They don't have nearly as much face-to-face -face time with their friends. But if you like video games, they get on and they play through headphones and they talk. And the socializing they get from that is really important and it matters. And you may lose a little bit in the lack of face-to-face, -face, but it's still giving them their essential needs. And, I use um, many stats. And, that, and that's the truth with uh, the, the whole argument with office space, which is just driven by the real estate industry who doesn't want to lose their downtown buildings. It's a, it's, it's, it's mm. we're changing. It's okay. I mean, look, social media is not perfect Wait and it's sec. caused a lot of issues and depression, anxiety and so forth in terms of. You last week were talking about how people are befriending squirrels now because they have no socialization or interaction. I didn't say that was why you read into that. That's your projection. That is why? No, it's Nobody's not. Nobody's hanging out anymore. Why don't people hang out anymore? They do hang out. They just hang out in different ways. That's not real life. Yeah, so... Get off my lawn. But, but people, it is. People, it's just changing. What did people think when all of a sudden, oh my God, you can get across the country in four hours instead they of... They thought uh, I could go hang out with more people. Of, instead of four days, oh, well, what about all the time you spent traveling together? Well, no, you can just get on a plane and do that. Every time there's some kind of technological innovation, there are going to be people like yourselves that complain and say, what the hell is no, happening no, no, no. to humanity? Hey, you know who else <laughs> liked to work from home? Ted Kaczynski. Okay. <laughs> Do you like working from home, Sean? Uh, I like both. Uh, both. Of, course, of course you do. So, I mean, writing, writing is a solitary thing. Okay. It just is. So you write by yourself. Uh, you write from a press box. You write sometimes. From, you write from the airport. You write from the seat of no, your plane. I write from my car. Sometimes you often write while we expect you to be engaged in the podcast. I so, mean, you sometimes write from I everywhere. write from my car. Last last week, I wrote a column about it was a silly column, but uh, about the line schedule, and I, I I thought let's let's do a prediction column. We go game by game, all seventeen games, and I oh, based, he's working a plug in. I okay. based the winners. At, yeah, I'm sorry to take that away from oh, you. Shush. We, uh, you know, I based the winners and losers Note on who self. had the better Sean wrote some on the the better who had the better food, which cities, <laughs> and it was really fun. And I yeah, I did that from my desk. I didn't I didn't need anybody telling me next to me 
how to do it or what to do. And then you send it on because we have what we call computers. Wait, so, so you feel... Internet, and we have phones. And you we feel have, that if you have a colleague who has a suggestion or is interested in what you're doing, they're telling you what to do, you're not going to be bossed around by that guy in the chair next to me. No, but maybe there's an over-the-top fucking know-it-all next to you who thinks they know better than you. I'm not saying you, but who thinks they know better. I mean, there are pros and cons of this stuff. Okay, so you gave us the pros that people can become misanthropic and disconnected and anxious and yeah, get because they have to listen to bombastic, uh, uh, arrogant colleagues all day. I just think it's good. Oh, to is be, that, is I that think the it's way good it is to be in the, in the sports people. reporting booth there in the press box? You got, you sometimes you, it is. You got Wojo lording it over you. Oh, he's not predictions. Like that. He's not like That's that. not what you said before the show. You said Wo- <laughs> You said Adolf Wojanowski, wasn't it? Oh my God. No, he's not like that at all. I'm just, I'm just saying. Some people work better, you know. Is it Carlos? Is Carlos the one who's pushing some, you around? Some people work better. Uh, Are you getting bullied by, by Carlos? themselves? You know, you is get this, your socialization. You haven't in other denied ways. it yet. You haven't. Is this Carlos? Why do you have to have face to face? I mean, what's the point? Why do you have face to face? Well, unless it's doggy style. <laughs> I mean, face to face. Before the show, we were just talking about being in the office, and a colleague said. Hey, I'm writing about this. Do you know anything about this? And so people who sat around this colleague were able to make suggestions. And some of them were useful, and some of them were like, yeah, not really what I'm looking for. But it made this final product better. Whereas if this person was working from home, they weren't going to poll the staff to say, does anybody know about this? They might not even think to call somebody because like, well, we're both working kind of late. I don't want to disturb them at home. But the ability to collaborate, to work together, to share ideas, to engage with other carbon-based units. You can still do it. What? With a, with a tweet, with a, with with a, a computer, text? With, with a, a Zoom, with a Teams it's meeting. Oh, yeah. That's, that's why we have more anxiety because people are like, oh, I see somebody else. Am I supposed to do that? Uh, we have, yeah, well, I agree. The, the anxiety and depression and the bullying and all that, but that's because everybody thinks they're on a stage. people feel alone. No, it's because they think they're on a stage, right? It's Instagram in particular. It's TikTok. No, they're, 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 that's absolutely true. You, you guys have seen all the stories recently about the school says a few school districts that banned phones. I don't know. I want to say middle school. Maybe it was high school. And just over the course of, I don't know, a couple of months, and they saw bullying go down, and they saw the grades stick up a little bit. They saw anxiety go down and depression go down. Yeah, because it's easier to bully someone not face-to-face with them. No, for sure. For sure. Although bullying's gone down overall in society because we pay attention to it. Well, and that's a different conversation. But I have a lot of students who are graduating, and they went through the uh, remote learning mm. through college, and they feel cheated. And they feel like they didn't have a college experience and they feel disconnected and they don't feel like they're a part of something because they weren't with other people. For sure. And uh, my own son felt that way. He was at Michigan State. He started during COVID on Zoom. So you're, you're, you're repudiating your own son's No, friends. no, no. I'm talking for certain circumstances. coming up. Save certain a few circumstances. Bucks, kids. On the other hand, no, for sure. On the other hand, there are plenty of people that, that learn on a computer and take their classes at home and, and do just fine. So Watch it's just, porn. It's not one size fits all. Of course it's not. But yeah. I think. I think and you don't have whole, to be chained to a desk. I think working around other people is just. It's far more better. You talk about how you can collaborate on Zoom or these these visual, you know, telecommunication things. You still have to log in and set up and be there as opposed to just bumping into somebody and chatting and talking about For sure, something. but a lot of people don't a lot of people just don't like to navigate those spaces. And if they can do I, good if they can do good work, that's what matters. I mean, I would argue with Mike if we're just talking about the Detroit Free Press, we do more with fewer people and still do good work than we ever have. And we got some people who aren't doing shit. Yeah, you can focus on that, whatever. That's that's your nature. You're going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on the fact that the Free Press do, still does a lot of really, really good work and has done it through COVID, has done it through remote uh, remote writing, remote reporting, whatever. The, the, those are the facts. You want to you well, single out a couple of people you don't think, whatever. Well, here's some facts, I'm going to focus on the 70 or 80 people that do great shit. I think it's also a lot easier to goof off when you're at home. Yeah. What are you talking about? I used to go into the free press bed 25 years ago, and there'd be a gab sessions, and you couldn't get any yeah, work done. There are ideas you, coming people, out of that. No, no, because you, you're talking about Dave Chappelle's Rick James skit or whatever. Or you're talking about what you ate the night before, or the dinner party. Yeah, water or, oh cooler my God, conversation. Can you believe that editor and what they said? Oh, my God. Yeah. That, that is just, you, you think that's productive? I do. 
I didn't and, know. And you, and you think that's been eliminated? You know how many texts I get? So can you believe what so and so did or no, email of chains? Not. That, or, that's our nature. That's not going to be eliminated. I'm just saying. There's also something to be said about being on a team and being around people. Yeah, and Sean, whenever you together. come into the studio, if it's like 1101, we got to go, we got to go. You want to catch up. You want to talk. You want to have some conversation. You want to have some chat. Who, who's you, saying we got to go? Mark's getting ready. Mark's you, still in production mode. You want to engage with mode. people hey. because that's natural. That's healthy. I'm saying that's what people do when they get together. They want to say, hey, what's going on? What's happening? You know, the story that resonates the most with this podcast from me had to do, I told on a phone from L.A. about a rental car and a jacket. I I'm just saying it's it's we we can't act like we got to be together all the time. We don't. Yes, we need each other. I think that's different. I think people should be should make should force themselves to be around people more often. I think it's just too easy to isolate yourself. And let me tell you what I've seen in my life and what I've seen as a, a union official and someone who has a lot of people who come to me with their grievances. When you don't see people, when you don't interact with them, you forget about their humanity, and you build them up into monsters, and you get really angry at them, and you bitch about them, no and question. you make them think you make yourself feel like they're less than human, and then you run into them, and all of a sudden, a lot of that melts away. And I see this with people who talk shit to me all the time, and they run into me somewhere, and the look on their face, I'm just like, "Yeah, you're not gonna say it, are you, bitch?" Yeah, but in and the then it, it goes away. You know why? Because when you see people, you have to acknowledge but that's their humanity, not, and yeah, we're losing. Yeah, yeah. That when we're sitting at home, uh, Jeffrey tubing it during a Zoom meeting <laughs> when we should be working. But that's not to, to say that we were production. If we're talking about production, you got no argument. If you're talking about the good of humanity, maybe. But, but, look, think, think about, uh, think about the, the the ways we. You're talking about if we don't communicate. You know, a great, a great. Here's a here's a great example. This is just a little niche that I happen to work in because I'm a sports writer. I get somebody who's uh, really angry at a column I wrote. They send me an email. They think they're sending it out into the ether, right? Like I'm not real. Mm -hmm. But then I respond to them, and their tone completely changes. Especially if I uh, am polite back to them, which I always am. Well, some communication is better than no. Communication. But that's my point. I mean, it's not like we're not communicating. It's just the forms of communicating, how we communicate, are changing. But I don't. But to ML's point, I don't think that original email gets sent if they see you in person. They're not going to say that to you in person. No, but why would they? Why would they? That's well, not that's how, how they this, feel. I, yeah, I, I but they're know. not. They're not my newsroom. They're 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 a customer. I mean, they're a, we have a, we have a lot of this. But you get a, a, the phone's not a bad replacement. Email's not a bad replacement. Zoom's not a bad place. It's not perfect. You know what? They, I still get the nasty responses on email. Sometimes people thank you, but most of the time, if you're getting if you're getting vinegar, there's more vinegar. Tuesday night, last no, last Wednesday. Sorry, I was at Thomas McGee's in Eastern Market, and some guy was sitting at the bar. He knew who I was. He immediately came on salty, and I said, "Hey, dude, what's going on, man? You know, yeah, that's me. I'm the bad guy. You know, let's talk about it." We ended up buying each other a drink. Had a great, great conversation, a great interaction. That doesn't happen with a text. That doesn't well, happen it happens with email because it happens. To, no, it doesn't happen with the email because it you don't get a me. chance what are to you disarm. Talking about? Because when the guy talks and yanking to me, he immediately saw the look on my face, and it wasn't like let's throw down. It's more like yeah, okay, pal, you got your opinion. That's cool. Well, don't, don't what you brings you here? That is not that doesn't happen electronically. No, you really just see that doesn't. with political arguments. Oh, but it too. does. I I email back and say thank you so much for taking the time to read. And thanks for reading the free press. And, uh, you know, I, I humbly disagree, whatever. Uh, and then I get uh, nine times out of ten, I get a much lower temperature email back. And then we might have a dialogue. Or maybe not. Maybe they just want to be acknowledged. Whatever. Of course that happens. That's like saying. Thanks for invalid invalidating my experience. No, I'm not trying to. I'm not. I'm not. A, <laughs> no, your experience is totally valid. But so is mine. That's like saying. No, it's not. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, what's the the, the Gutenberg? Oh, the press is going. We're going to actually write. And we're going to publish. And that's how we're going to tell stories. Fuck that. I want to sit around a campfire. And I want to tell them face to face. No book will ever be able to replicate that. And that's just not true. Sean, if you were running a company, um, one that you know really? uses office space, would you want your employees to be there, or would you want them to be working remotely? Depends on what kind of company. It depends on what we're making. It depends on uh, what we're producing. Um, insurance uh, was the first thing that popped in my head. That's an office no. type job. No, I, does it matter? I, when I get on the phone with my insurer, and I've been, I was lucky enough. You know, I grew up in the military, so I've had USA insurance all my life. Or since I was a teenager, right? Use insurance. And um, and um, whenever I talk to them, their headquarters is in San Antonio, a big military town, right? 
three, there used to be three Air Force bases there. Anyway, I, every time I'm on the phone with somebody, I always ask them because I like to talk to, to people and get to know them a little bit. I say, hey, we're, especially they're looking up something. I said, where are you? What's the weather like? All right, say so you're running the corporate office. They used to be in San Antonio, but now they're all over. And do you know what they, a lot of people tell me these days? Oh, I'm at home. I hear that all the time. Okay. I'm at home. Does that affect their service? I haven't noticed I think you're more productive and more creative when you're around other people, personally. That's because that's, that's, just my that's you. And, no, that's, I, and that's totally fine for you. That's I'm, great. I'm also basing that on friends I know who are like, oh, God, I'm never going back to the office. I'm like, why? I can do whatever I want all day you're long. You're surrounded by a certain subset of Michigan football fans that graduated from the school in the 90s with l frat boy leanings. You know what I mean? It's what? Uh, oh, judgy. Jeez. <laughs> What are you talking about? Like, Yikes. Oh, it's a very, if you uh, call me as an insurance agent, I just double your quote with that kind of shit. I just think hey, it's well, how's healthy. the weather there, you elitist scumbag, no, racist of course it's uh, healthy piece of shit? Of course it's healthy oh, you get out You're going to need a $10 million It was the deductible. whole point. Of course it's good to do I that. I don't want my kids sitting around playing games online or FaceTiming. I'd rather they go out and play with somebody. Hey, you know what's healthy? Go out and play a game with a ball. Hey, obesity problem gone away. Instead of, oh, I'm going to do Minecraft for 19 hours with my headset on. <laughs> How about or you, or you uh, running just, and jumping and, yeah, you can and, do that. and feeling that's, the grass under your feet? That's not for everybody either. That's not, you know, you, you can do all of it. But I just feel like it's just easier a lot of times just to stay home. And I think it's a problem. Yeah, life should be a little hard. You should yeah, push oh yourself God. a little bit. That's why we go to school if life wasn't supposed to be hard, they'd say, well, math sucks, so don't do that. Back in my day. Do Spelling <laughs> sucks, don't do that. Then you wouldn't learn to write like Sean loves to do so much alone in I his cabin. I don't like to write. I hate writing. Where he's writing letters about I don't hate uh, it. I just don't the like end it. of days. Hating's too strong. I don't like writing. Oh, for God's sake. I don't. I'm going to move this along by asking you, ML, Sorry. what kind of feedback did you get on your column about um, Londo? Did you write your column? Where did I write my column? <laughs> At the Free Press. And, and uh, here's a prime example. Here's a prime example. And by the way, I need to tell you before we get to that, this lively discussion is brought to you by Dr. Yaldo and the Yaldo Eye Center, where he can help you see better than perfect. But you have to go there. But you got to go there. Yeah, he can't if do that remotely. If you've been staring at a screen too much, he can help you. Yeah, his lasers aren't that, that effective from miles and miles and more. You got to go in there. And we'll tell you how later on. If you want to save for that retirement so you can sit in that rocking chair and play, uh, play Grand Theft Auto 99 <laughs> with some other octogenarian... Well, Luke Nowacki can make that possible. He probably doesn't want to make it possible because Luke gets out there and, and engages with life. But if, if you're a couch potato, he'll make sure that you're one of those garlic mashed couch potatoes, you know, with chives on it. Because you're stretching. It, I know. It's, this, is, this is when you're riffing like that. And if you really want to play, come play Detroit where you can play with real humans. <laughs> Think about that. It's pretty cool. And if you listen up, I'll tell you how to save 10% on your registration. But here's a perfect example. I am fortunate to sit uh, a couple desks away from Clara Hendrickson, who's been on this show before, a fantastic reporter at the Detroit Free Press. And for a week, I've been calling people to try and find out more about a woman who circulated petitions for Adam Holier, or Adam Olier, as some people call him, who may be knocked off the ballot in his race against Sri Tanadar for Congress. In fact, I went to one door, and Mark Cut One will tell people what I found when I was looking for Jasmine Webb. Is, is there a chance that she lived here before and has and moved away? No one lived there by that name, sir. Okay. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be tedious, but any chance you've ever heard of a Jasmine Webb? No. <laughs> okay. Um, no. <laughs> pre pretty definitive. That's two no's. So all week I'm calling everybody I know in Detroit politics. Who is this person? She runs, she, you know, she's, she's collected a lot of petitions that are now under scrutiny. Who the hell is she? And I'm writing my column and I turn and, and Clara, who covers politics, heard me say Jasmine Webb. And she said, I think that's Jazz Webb, who's Olier's campaign manager. Oh, now, this is after four days of trying to find any trace of this person somewhere, physically going to the address she lists and finding out she doesn't live there. At least the people who live there deny that she lives there. And one of my colleagues overheard this and spontaneously makes a break in my case. And I call the Olier campaign and say, hey, is Jazz Webb Jasmine Webb? They're like, yes, of course. And I say, well, can I talk to her? And of course I can't because she's in the middle of a big controversy here. 
that was something that would not have happened otherwise. Did you just That's say That's what something? happened when you work with people. That's what happens when you're in an environment. And these people don't come in every day. I don't come in on Fridays. I come in late and I stay late. So we're not there from 9 to 5 sitting next to each All other. All I know this is This isn't the late, great Dabney Coleman's classic oh, 9 to 5. Oh, rest in God peace. rest his soul. Oh, Dabney it's Coleman. like Buffalo Bill. Oh, Gina Davis. Yes. <laughs> That's right. No. All I know is that if you worked it from home a little bit more, you'd probably save money on your hair product. You wouldn't have to worry about tossing it up like that. You know what I mean? Because you're not going to care if you do that at home. Yes, I am. I, I always want to look my yeah, best. Fortunately, it's not that difficult. But it's Still working. Yeah. It's, no, that, I'm not saying you need to work in your underwear and listen to the Smiths uh, all day long. That's what people do. Something do they? Like do they? Yeah. And while they're, while they're playing Worlds of War. <laughs> or Red Dead Rebellion. What what is Brandon playing? Red Dead Redemption. Red Dead yeah. Redemption. Yeah. No. It's, it's. But this is what happens. There are moments like that. This is a force multiply when you're with other people. So, Mark, to get back to the column. Yes, that's other people. Basically, I spent a week trying to find out who these people are who are at the middle of this controversy that may cost Adam Olier basically a trip to Washington because. When he first ran against Sri Tanadar, he was one of multiple black candidates running to represent a predominantly black congressional district, and the vote got split up, and Sri Tanadar won a plurality in the Democratic primary, and because no Republican's ever going to win that district, you can be elected to Congress was basically a quarter of the vote if enough people chop up the remaining 75%, and that's what happened. So Sri Tanadar basically went with the nuclear option and tried to get Adam Ollier knocked off the ballot by saying, we see fraudulent petitions, and if there's enough fraudulent signatures, he won't reach the 1,000 threshold. You need to have 1,000 signatures from registered voters in your district to qualify to run for Congress. And Sri Tanadar found hundreds upon hundreds of petitions, signatures that appeared to be invalid. And some of them were collected by, supposedly, Jasmine Webb, and also some were collected by a gentleman named Londell Thomas. And what I found out is that Londell was working for a lot of candidates, collecting a lot of petition signatures, allegedly, but really not doing that. Because there's a gentleman named Charles Longstreet who paid him nearly $16,000 to help his campaign for Wayne County Circuit Court judge. And Mr. Longstreet collected 2,600 signatures. In this case, he needed 4,000. Londell charged him a shitload of money to collect more signatures. And when they went to Lansing to turn those signatures in, on a day they picked to honor Charles Longstreet's father, who had died a year before, Londell shows up with a stack of petitions that were for another candidate he was working for. And by then, Longstreet's like, whoa, 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 brother, what is going on? Where are all these petitions from Hill Harper coming from? And Londell says, oh, you know what? I picked the wrong stack. I'll go home. I'll get your petitions. I'll come back. I'll turn them in, and everything will be hunky-dory. Only he didn't, and Mr. Longstreet isn't going to make the ballot because he was cheated. This also raised questions about, does Hill Harper have enough good signatures? There's other candidates that Londell Thomas worked for. Do they have legitimate signatures? Are they going to get knocked off the ballot? Because collecting signatures, believe it or not, folks, is big business. Yep. You can get 5 to $15 per good signature. And so I wanted to find out from Londell what was going on. And Mark, in cut two, you'll find out what happened when I went to the address where Londell claims he lives. Okay, well, is this where he stays? Not frequently, no. Okay. Do you, do you know what his, his legal residence is? Well, I want to give out anyone's personal information. I'll just have him call you. Hmm. And, of course, he didn't call me, but later that week, his lawyer did. And I said, well, I think Londell might want to explain himself because he's got a lot of people mad at him because he is ruining political careers, which is strange because he helped get Mike Duggan elected in 2013. And, that, and that's what I was going to... That was one of the first things that popped out in the story is, you know, the one guy... Who's the lawyer you said that got ripped off? I forgot. Was it Long... Uh, Charles Longstreet, Longstreet II. There you go. He vetted this guy, and this guy has quite the impressive background, but what's interesting is you found out that he declared bankruptcy 
or, or had no, financial he, troubles. I'm sorry. Yeah, a few right. years ago he had financial troubles. Looks like he got through them. So you so, know, you so think is, he's okay. Is this a grift that this guy's doing based on just all this goodwill he had built up from all the good work he did, or is he just that incompetent? Well, I think one of the problems is instead of interacting with other people and getting them to sign petitions, he stayed at home yeah. and signed the petition forms himself. Yeah. And they were obvious forgeries, all the same handwriting. So did you did you look at a bunch of the signatures? Oh, yeah. I looked at 1,700 signatures. And, of course, you know whose signature I saw in there twice? <laughs> His own. His own, but who yeah, else? I know. Th- this part made me laugh out loud. Teresa Bald is my wife. She <laughs> allegedly signed uh, Adam Ollier's petitions twice when, in fact, she didn't sign it either time. And uh, we're trying to figure out how her name got on there. Um, but I think what we've determined is that good petition signatures, registered voters who have a track record of, of voting are kind of like Henrietta Lacks. And if you don't know who that is, this was a black woman from the Baltimore area whose DNA was preserved and then used oh, for yeah. decades fascinating for story. experiments. Yeah, this is a major book. It was it was a big shocking thing, but but for there's something about her DNA sample, her cells, that the scientists really liked. So they kept replicating them to do That's why, because they would experiments. replicate themselves. Okay, yeah. so they were just very resilient, yep. I guess. Yep. So now Teresa Baldis is like the Henrietta Lacks of petition signatures because there's something <laughs> about her long, funny name. It's Tresevienne, which is very hard to spell. So people are cranking out this long name and then trying to fake her signature because, folks, some of you out there are valuable. Your name, your signature is valuable, and people are using it to put on petitions without your knowledge, without your consent, and they're cashing in on it, and some of them are getting caught. And you've pointed out to me before, signatures are important because it shows you have a level of organization and a team that can, you know, get this stuff together because you're going to be running or you're trying to be in charge of a public office. How how similar is this to what happened, say, with... um, It's not. What? It's not similar. James Craig. <laughs> James Craig and Barry Johnson. Yeah, extremely similar. And in, in fact... Oh, sorry. And this also this goes all the way back to Thad McCotter. I don't know if anybody oh, remember remembers Thad. him. Yeah. His, yeah. his staff was like photocopying signatures and stuff. And there's this thing called roundtabling where people are very sensitive to obvious forgeries. So what we'll do is we'll all sit around a table. With different pens. And we'll each sign a name, and then we'll slide the petition over. Then you'll sign a name, so it looks like different handwriting on the whole thing. And, uh, and you know, these clerks have seen enough of this. They've caught on to it, and so they watch out for it. So what's happened is uh, Mark Brewer, who was a former chairman of the Democratic State Democratic Party, who now is a political consultant and a lawyer, He's the one who challenged the petitions for James Craig and Perry Johnson and like half a dozen other Republican gubernatorial candidates in 2022 and got them knocked off the ballot. He's now challenging some judicial candidates and some Democrats have noticed, oh, wow, these people who turned in what appear to be fraudulent signatures for some of the judicial candidates have also collected a lot of signatures for Republicans who are running for U.S. Senate, Mike Rogers. Mm-hmm. Peter Meyer, Sandy Pensler, uh, a, uh, I think um, maybe another candidate that, that they're asking, the uh, Democratic Party is asking the, or I shouldn't say the Democratic Party, I should say people who support, generally support Democrats, are asking the State Elections Bureau to take a look at the petitions for these Republican senatorial candidates with the goal of finding enough fraudulent petition signatures to knock them off the ballot, in which case... But isn't that going to happen to Hill Harper as well? Because he's... So he's, Hill Harper's he's, a Democrat. Some yeah, people know right. him from the good doctor. Um, some people some know people him because he's... a carpet bagger. He's got like a million degrees from Harvard. Like he's... Yeah. it's he, On paper, this dude's super impressive. I met him on Mackinac last year. Seems like a very nice guy. Kind of new to Detroit. Has some businesses. Yeah, when's he going to move here? Well, he's, he's <laughs> been spending a lot of time meeting people recently, that's for sure. But he has a lot of these Londell Thomas signatures, and one of the things that will be very interesting to see is if he has so many Londell Thomas signatures that, um, that he can't stay on the ballot, in which case Alyssa Slotkin 
and probably Nasser Beydoun will be your candidates for the Democratic nomination for the Senate seat currently occupied by Debbie Stabenow. And there may be no Republicans whatsoever. So this race could be over in August if all these folks get bounced off of there. And it's because of these petition frauds. This is like the most geeky thing in the world, getting people to sign a piece but, of but paper. It, but it matters, too. And, and you, you wrote about it, because I was thinking, you know, there's going to be some people out there that are like, well, why do I care about, um, what's his name, Alie? Uh, Adam, Adam Olie. Yeah, yeah he's, not, he's not my rep. He's not going to be my rep. Why does this matter? But your column, you point out the whole Jocelyn Benson angle, because I thought it was really weird when he ran the whole uh, Democratic Party put a lot of effort behind him to you know, get rid of Sri Tanadar, who was the incumbent, which is very unusual. Yeah, well, well, Sri was born in India, still has a very heavy accent, uh, self-made millionaire. Yeah, it's, uh, you know. Everybody knows who Sri is. Yeah, he kind of made himself, Animali, I don't know. you know, the, the goofy little guy who wants to help people. Um, and uh, And he was elected to Congress, but, you know, He's brown, but he ain't black. And that's a real problem for a lot of people in Detroit. And so there is this big movement to get a black representative in Congress. J John James doesn't count because he's a Republican. So, uh, so people in Detroit and the metro area want to get a black congressperson in there, and they've coalesced behind Olie. And that means you've seen some extraordinary things, such as leading public officials, elected Democrats, Mike Duggan, Jocelyn Benson, endorsing someone in a primary against a sitting Democratic office holder. That almost never happens. When you have a primary like that, the elected officials stay out of it. But I think a lot of people are thinking Olier can beat Tanadar, and I think it's also a way to appeal to the black vote in Detroit. And both Duggan and Benson are expected to run for governor in 2024, and Benson, as the state's top elections official, is very careful not to endorse people. But she kind of made an exception to endorse Olier. And How unusual is that for a secretary of state? I mean, it kind of goes from, from, uh, from office holder to office holder. There may be some very partisan, because secretary of state is a partisan position. Mm -hmm. You know, there may be some who really feel strongly about trying to help members of their party get elected. But in general, I think you see secretaries of state and local clerks, for that matter, try not to endorse people because when they're responsible for counting the votes or determining whether someone's entitled to a spot on the ballot, folks are going to throw that in their face. Yeah. And it does raise a question. How objective are you if you've said, I want this person to win? When you said you want that person to win and you're counting the votes, are you now giving them the benefit of the doubt on every write-in that's up for grabs? Well, at, the, you... at the very least, you're giving you know the opportunity for people to use it to claim you know voter voter fraud. Well, that's the other problem. Or election interference. So much garbage has been thrown out since 2020 about election fraud, about dead guys from Venezuela manipulating machines that didn't happen, people you know taking wagons full of fake ballots to the Huntington Center didn't happen. All of this crap has been debunked. People have been trying to undermine confidence in our democracy by trying to establish some question as to whether or not we can trust the final vote count. No one in Michigan has come up with any evidence that these elections were not called fairly. Mm. In fact, some of the voter fraud that has been uncovered was by Republicans trying to vote for their dead relatives. These yeah. are isolated cases, nothing that would change the outcome of an election. But Michigan has, has, despite all the heat, been able to present itself as some place where you can trust the results of the election. Now the Secretary of State indirectly is involved in a case where there are fraudulent petition signatures. And I think people who have been trying to undermine confidence in our elections with no evidence whatsoever will seize on this and say, well, can we trust the Secretary of State? She was involved in voter fraud. No, she wasn't. She signed petitions. Uh, but those petitions were fraudulent. Yep. Perhaps, but not because oh, of anything yeah, she did. Wait, what was that? Hmm? What? what was that? Hmm? Oh, someone that was just agreeing. No, I was also just thinking, oh, this yeah, is... Sure. This, yeah. Oh, I see, I see. This is interesting, and Mike's got a good story. I wonder if huh. it might go across a little better if we just stop recording right now, and he went door-to-door -to, -door to our listeners and told them face-to-face. 
That is a totally different topic. I wonder than we were talking if about that earlier. would be. Uh, I wonder if that would be helpful. You know, actually, Mark, I think we have a story that Sean might be interested in. If you could cue that up for us. Oh yeah, this is this is more up uh, more up your alley here, Sean. What you're about to see is a Channel 4 News exclusive. His name is Nutty the Squirrel, and he's three years old. How about that? <laughs> that squirrel can water ski. Oh. <laughs> I think that'd be funnier. <laughs> if... That squirrel actually likes to interact with other human beings, too. No, I remember, I remember that clip. That would be funnier, though, if, if I weren't watching it on a computer. It was in a theater surrounded by 200 people. Right? You're right. That's the... you're, no, you're exactly right. The, uh, there are some experiences yeah. where the, collect, the, the collective laughter. By the way... Yeah. Um, well, you could you could watch no, it no, home, I, rubbing I, it out I, to I, whale's I, vagina, but, but, which I understand but, but, is what San Diego really means. Before we wrap all this up and get into geek and music and so on and so forth, <laughs> I, I want to ask you guys a sincere question, though. Why, why do you feel so strongly about all this when the numbers are not on your side? In other words, if we're just going by productivity, it's not... It's really not that close. The and these these studies started before COVID because they started as technology started to make it possible. Still a small sample Hi, size. Hybrid, hybrid. No, it's been going on seven, eight years now. Hybrid. Yeah, uh, but the technolo- technology also technology also changes within the workplace too. But people people talk about just being happier, the the freedom a little bit more, less distracted. There are lots of reasons well, it makes well, sense of course. that back up Wait why product. I, I don't now, think, look. If I you got to Rick and I are arguing about um, you have to be there at eight fifty five, and you're not allowed but, to leave until uh, five o five. It's better for often better for families, and I mean, not always. You know, maybe sometimes kids of are distracted. Course. But freedom but, and movement is always better, and, and almost and, and the divide though here. No, the last part of this question, the divide is, and what a lot of the studies I've seen, if you're if you ask leaders, whatever the business is, if you ask leaders and they're over fifty, their assumption is the productivity goes down because they can't see them because that's what they've known all their life. But the numbers are in fact the opposite. They go up. Leaders who are younger understand this a little bit better, and it's just like any other generational thing. But so so what well, is you it said that, hybrid. And the argument really started about whether or not you know kids just hanging out playing video games and watching each other. I don't, I don't know if that's the best thing and in the that, world. And that's a different thing. And I'm with you on school, but in terms of the workplace, Sean, I can write ten rem- cop stories tomorrow. I can write ten police stories tomorrow. Ten of them. Yeah. No problem. No problem. But if I'm going to go out to the site and I'm going to see what happened, and I'm going to talk to witnesses, and I'm going to talk to the family members whose lives have been changed irrevocably. I can't do 10 of those. Now, would you rather have 10 meaningless body count stories? Would you really want to connect with a human being who's suffering yeah, but that's and like, whose agony may help us say, wait uh, a minute, no, well, we need to stop not, but the that's like, say, I'm, you th- that's like me trying to argue, well, you, can't, you can build a car from home. You can't. You got to go to the factory and actually physically do it. Of course that. My question is, My question is, does the story suffer if you go back to your house to write it? No, it does not. If you go back? Well, no. no, it does not. Well, Sean, all. earlier in the show... That's my point. Without any prompting, you asked me for an example of how did, did somebody else help with the count? Or how did you find this out? And I gave you an example of how something happened. I gave you two examples that happened within 48 hours where two things that were produced by the free press were made better because of a spontaneous interaction with a colleague. Th- yeah. This should not be a numbers game. I don't want to sell widgets. What I want to do is tell the best stories we possibly can. And we're in a business that's about people. And if you're in journalism and you don't care about people, you should get out of journalism. And if you're in journalism because you care about people, you like to work with people. You want to connect with people. You want to interact with people. You want to have conversations at the water cooler. Yes, sometimes it's better to sit there at your dining room table and listen to Rice Cop for 24 hours straight so you can write the the magnum opus on Mike Duggan. That works too. The story's out in the world though, Mike, right? That's the point. I mean, of course you're going to go to the neighborhood when something happens. You can go to the city hall. You can go to the... You say, of course it doesn't happen. No, but I'm not... people writing from press releases. That's part of the... That's, oh, yeah. No, that's part of the work. But the, but we're talking about remote versus an office. That's what we're talking about. And there is no study that says it's better to be in an you office. Them all. Okay. None. Is that what you've been doing? That's a lot no, of studies you've been it's, reading. It's 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 a gut feeling based on. Well, you just said it was because studies, it's a lack of. A gut it's feeling. a gut feeling based on a lack of trust, based on a traditionalist way. Okay, if you're out of sight, you're not doing your job. 
And that's bullshit. And there's social science that backs it up. Yeah, I'd I mean, like to see. I hear a lot of references to social science and reading the studies. I haven't seen any specifics. Nobody is saying there's only one way to do it. What we're saying is there should be a combination. Yes, sometimes you want to work in isolation. Sometimes you want to work say, hey, how do you like this lead? What about that? Sometimes you want to go to lunch with people and say, hey, what are you working yeah. on? Ooh, that sounds cool. Or I know somebody who has a phone number there. Or I never thought of that. I wonder if I have a story like that on my beat where you want to participate. Yeah, maybe we don't need to go in the office on Monday. Maybe we don't well, need to not, go in on Friday. Just, maybe just, we don't need to go in on rush hour. It's not just journalism either, though, right? I mean, you would think a marketing department or a sales department, you might want to talk to the other people and bounce ideas off. Not in a fucking boring meeting where some guy's leading it, but... Yeah, Jonas in- Salk. Hey, whose sandwich is that? That's uh, <laughs> mine. Throw it out. It's got no, some green are, shit on there it. There are certain Millions things. of lives have been saved by working together because of that old sandwich, Sean. There are certain things that, that need to be collaborative in person. Why do you hate but Jonas Salk? there are Salk? a lot of things that do, do you not. Hate people? You can still be collaborative and be home, right? It's, it's totally different, which I think is the crux of our argument. Oh, well... I think collaborating well, on Zoom is so far, it's so different but, than just but it's not working just, with somebody and well, in the same room. Well, it can be. It depends on what you're doing. But but how do you explain the uptick in productivity and for people well, maybe generally it's not good feeling, productivity. And people generally feeling better? Maybe quantities over, over the quality. People generally feeling, do you know the anxieties through the roof in this country right now? Yeah, in this world? Because people are arguing on their computers and yeah, Zooming. Because the only and, time no, no, they but, see people is when they look happy on Facebook. When you're sitting in an office and you see somebody going, oh my God, I can't get this story done. Oh my God, nobody's calling me back. Oh my God, my kid just called me. For, my kid's having a problem. Oh, my mother is sick. Oh, my dog just shit all over the rug. You actually see people in their natural state when it's not some curated and for, bullshit. Yeah. Every somebody person, posted. every person like that. That's there's life. another person who's like, "Oh my God, here comes a bullying cocksucker walking down." Excuse the language. So I understand you don't like me, Jerk. Sean, and you don't who's want to walk in the same into place the office as me. And is going to tell me, you know what I mean? I mean, right? I mean, that's is that who we work you, with? Is that who you think we employ at the Free Press? No, I'm not talking about the Free Press specifically. I'm just well, saying. What are you in talking general, about? Because that's I've, where you I've, work. Look, I've worked with some bullying cocksuckers, and you know what happens when we're in the office. You would talk to other people and go, God, that guy is such a bullying cocksucker. Ask what it's been like for women in the workplace for the last 70 years. How was that to get their asses grabbed? It would be better if they have stayed the comments home. Made. Be yes, better. of course. So, Sean wants to keep women in the house. So women only go to, women are, Women at work are only harassed? That's what happens? No, they I'm just saying, you act like that. this has been some great panacea for society. It's no, I'm not, not saying it's a panacea, but you're acting like this is this I, I, is the I, seventh ring of hell. No, I'm we're, acting I, like there's a reason it's changing and there, there's a reason it's by and large a good oh, thing. And is it perfect? Of course not. And there's going to be some it's not for negative everything. unintended consequences oh, from it. And that's, uh, that's what I think ML and I are talking about. I think when you work with other people, you learn how differences can be good. You learn how to work with differences. You learn a lot of empathy, you too. Can, yes, you do. No question. Well, if you but sit behind you a screen, still... I don't think you get the same... You don't get the same... I, I just, as it's long just as you hear same. some... I mean, I you know, I think... I'm big on hearing somebody's voice, too, right? What do you mean? For sure. Like, hearing the tenor, the tone, and the voice. You can well, the learn... body language, too. No, the body language, hear. for sure. Body language matters, too. But it's not all or nothing. That's all I'm saying. Nobody's There's, saying it is, but I don't know where you've been working where it's just bullies and ass pinchers. <laughs> I'm glad you quit that job 40 years ago before you came to the free press. I mean, we have a very enlightened workplace, and not only do we have an enlightened, an enlightened workplace, we have a place when people do things like that, it's not tolerated. It's reported. Those people are spoken to. But I guess if they're working at home, nobody sees them pinching an ass or watching porn so they can go and be the complete shitbag that they are without having some colleague or some supervisor say, hey, son, that's not the kind of place we want to have. That's not the kind of society we want to be a part of. You can't do that. Or having some calling up in your business and worrying about what you're working on when it's not their business at all. Well, then you tell them it's not your There's business. a lot of that, too. Oh, really? Where do you see that? No, that's just been my experience in every newsroom I've ever been in. Well, you haven't been in any newsrooms. I mean, we don't have bullying or ass pinchers in ours, but uh, is that the way it was in uh, when you were working for Gutenberg, who I heard you reference <laughs> later earlier in your re- in your resume? I'm just saying, why do we record? Hey, you got him to smile. All right. Oh, why do we record the podcast? Yeah, no, we t- we tell stories because the, the Sean, it, check out the it, Steins on that one over there. Hey, wait a second. As this, long as we're as long as we're, telling I'd like to give her some schnitzel. As long as we're telling stories, look, I personally don't miss, you think this podcast is a lot better when all three of us are here. 
the yes and no. Yeah, you guys have had awesome. a lot of fun with me on the road. You know what I mean, right? So. Well, I, Exactly, because you're out on the road, you're interacting with people. prostitutes. Interact- yeah, but I'm calling Keeping souvenirs. Over, but I'm calling in over the phone. Sometimes it's Zoom. Well, it's usually Zoom because I it's used a necessity. To be on the phone. Exactly, but that still works. That's the that's the thing. Yes, right? we're saying a combination. Nobody's saying that you should be locked oh. into an office. And kids need to get outside. Yeah. Yeah, just just evolve, please. Adapt a little bit. <laughs> How many people have sakes. met some of their <laughs> How many people uh, have I, met some of their best friends? At work, how many people have met their spouses? Do, you know how many people. You know, how do people? How do young people date now? Tell them, Mark. With their app. I don't know. Exactly. How do they date? That's and how they, happy that's are they? they? That's how they. I mean, I don't know the people. Terribly, they, uh, they yeah. seem pretty happy to me. So, I mean, it, it, a lot of people are meeting just a screw. Yeah. Which, hey, I'm I'm all for screwing. It's oh, it's one of my favorite things to do. But like I'm not that, sure that that, that, to, that translates that. into a, a long lasting uh, healthy relationship. Whatever. That's always happened. People just used to do that in bars, and now now it's set up online. Whatever. But but people also meet. At least in bars, you and, knew you weren't well, talking think, to think, that and, linebacker's and significant pretend girlfriend. I think to that point, people uh, meet significant others online. Since too, you love studies so much, they do show like eHarmony, the ones that use more um, like algorithms to match people up, the websites as opposed to say Tinder. Yeah, Tinder's or Hinge. better. Huh? I, they, I've read they that have Tinder a higher successful rate. Yeah, success because rate, it turns yeah. out if you are attracted to somebody, you'll stick with them. Yeah, it's like you can love somebody's mind, but. You got like the behind too. Oh, it's uh, that's all foreign to me for sure. People meeting that way, but but that's all, you know. It's just that's okay. It's how it's how it goes. It's they're comfortable with it. So do we have that drop about Sean's uh, <laughs> how Sean oh, how yeah. meets people? Are you talking about this girl? Speaking of Memphis, I went. I once went through there with an unhinged uh, gal. Where'd you meet her at? Uh, we were both banquet waiters at a hotel in Austin. Hmm. So we still say hi every now and again. Hey, you, you, you work together. Yeah, but you Well, can't. imagine if you didn't go in there. How do you serve food remotely? I don't know. I, DoorDash, uh, I right? Her. Yeah, but that's not remote. You're still taking it physically. How do you get Door food dash. to somebody? I mean, unless you're... Uh, physically, right? Unless you're in Dora and you can twitch up somebody's food like uh, across the... Uh, across oh, the, oh, you know? oh, oh, God. I just was thinking to you, Sean, um, not because it was about schnitzel, but there's an episode of The Untouchables where Elizabeth Montgomery is a scheming um, oh. gangster mall, oh. and the guy who secretly loves her is Mr. Tate. Oh, that's interesting. He, gets, he gets killed because he betrayed her, and then she betrayed him. She was cool. Yeah. So anyways. Okay. All right. Well, tell us about Luke Nowacki. Or- oh, well, let me tell you about Dr. Yaldo. <laughs> or Dr. Yaldo. There you go. Because, you know, when you're playing all those video games or you're looking at people <laughs> online, you still want to have good vision. You're probably wearing contacts and glasses and stuff like that. It, that you, you know, it, studies have shown, every study has shown it's better to have good vision. And we recently heard from a young guy named Brandon, or Brendan. Brandon we actually see, Brendan we heard from, who's a salesman at a Detroit radio station who got custom LASIK from Dr. Yaldo just last week and is pretty much blown away by how incredible it feels to be able to now see a lot better than he ever did with his yucky old plastic film eyeball clinging contacts. Yes, custom LASIK gives most people better than 2020 vision, which is considered perfect vision. Well, I've got 2015 and so does Mark because we both had LASIK. That's better than perfect vision. So we can spot a dime from a mile away. The Drew Lane audience and maybe the soul of Detroit as well, skews a little bit older, and the bifocal implants for people 40 and older is an even simpler procedure than LASIK. Each year, millions of older Americans get standard implants to replace their cataract-damaged lenses. Now these amazing bifocal implants solve distance and near-vision issues, allowing you to throw away those annoying reading glasses. I think I have a pair in like every room of my house until Teresa steals them so she can sign some petitions. <laughs> all those procedures are all these procedures are painless and take mere minutes. So let Dr. Yaldo give you a huge lifestyle bump. Get rid of those eye infections, the 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 cysts on your eyelids from always sticking your filthy digits in your in your orbits. Spare your life the annoyances of glasses, contacts, and readers. Get a free evaluation at YaldoEyeCenter.com. And when you go see Dr. Y, tell him that ML sent you. And while you're seeing clearly, look at the future. Uh, Tough to see. Tough to see. But there's a guy who can help you sleep well at night because he looks around corners and 
and he figures out things that can help you live a little better and sleep a little better at least. That's Luke Nowacki because if you're not a big-time city official who can travel on other people's dimes or a political contributor who gets hooked up with government contracts, you're going to need some help with your finances. Now, if you're not among the swells lining your pockets with taxpayers' money, if you're someone who actually works for a living at home or remotely. Wherever, anywhere. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Call financial specialist Luke Nowacki at 248-663-474. You, you can call him or you can go see him. He'll discuss strategies on how to grow your assets from annuities to in individual retirement accounts to college savings. Make that call today. You've got kids and kleptocrats to feed. Luke Nowacki's at 248-663-4748. And when you call Luke or go see him in person, he'll make it all about you, sweetheart. Securities and investment advisory services offered through Bonaic Well. Sync member FINRA SIPC Bonaic Well. Sync is separately owned and other entities and or marketing names. Products or services referenced here are independent Bonaic Well. Sync. So uh, if you're not sitting there in your rocking chair or your, your high-tech gaming chair with haptics and all that other crazy <laughs> shit that make you feel like you're actually getting shot or shooting somebody cool, that sounds great. <sighs> or when you're done bullying people or pinching ass in the office, you can come out and play with some <laughs> real people who have bats and will hit you back if you're not nice. And so that's why I like to recommend Come Play Detroit. In fact, the Detroit Free Press has a softball team. We're called Fake Softball. Why? Because kind of, like, of fake news? Fake news, oh. but, you know, we're a real softball team. See, I knew uh, it all along. That's, that's pretty clever. So uh, we come together because we like to be with each other. You and do? so uh, we do it with Come Play Detroit. They have volleyball. They have softball. They're signing up for the, the next summer season right now. Get on there right away. Uh, come Play Detroit is my choice for softball and volleyball, but they offer a wide variety of sports from sand volleyball to pickleball to kickball, you know, you name it. They play all year round, offering everything from one-day tournaments to seasons that last eight to ten weeks. Again, the summer softball season is registering now. You can sign up as an individual, as part of a small group, or as a full team. Either way, Come Play Detroit's friendly staff will help you find the right fit. And if you know me, you know I like a good deal. If you sign up as an individual, go to ComePlayDetroit.com. If you're on a team, you'll have individual signups. At any rate, when you go to ComePlayDetroit.com, you can get 10% off your individual sign-up, off your registration. If you use promo code SOUL, that's S-U-L, S-O-U-L. <laughs> I'm all worked up here. Start over again. <laughs> S-O-U-L to get 10% off your first registration at ComePlayDetroit.com. Go do it, and I will see you on the Field of Valor. Oh, man, the geeks have inherited the earth. Yeah, I do that. What a dork. Does him wanting to play with us again mean that he's turning into a geek, or we're turning into cool guys? Some people know art, and some people say they know art when they see it. Well, there's a billionaire in Australia who saw art, and she didn't like it. She's Australia's richest woman, and she demanded that the National Gallery of Australia remove a portrait of her. The painting by the artist Vincent Namachira is one of numerous portraits on display at the Canberra Gallery in Namachira's first major survey exhibition. Well, the gallery rebuffed Gina Reinhardt's demands, but guess what? It kind of backfired. She didn't want anybody to see this portrait. And it is oh, not... The, str a, the Streisand effect? It is not a pretty... Exactly. Exactly. When she said, take it down, everybody went to go see her. And in fact, it's been seen many more times than it otherwise would have been seen. The gallery told Guardian Australia that there had been a noticeable increase in visitors to the National Gallery, as well as digital channels, over the past week. Google Trends has also given a sweeping indicator of worldwide gain in traction for the search term Gina Reinhardt. Before May 15th, the day the first stories about Reinhardt's portrait demand was published, interest in Reinhardt on Google was at roughly zero. Have you seen the picture? If you are a Patreon subscriber, you are now looking at the portrait that Gina Reinhardt doesn't want you to see. And I will it's just pretty, say... It's not terribly flattering for I will her. just say, it's understandable... <laughs> why she'd be upset. Why she wouldn't want people to see this. Oh, oh man, he had like two chins and uh, the eyes are all skew and the nose is turned. It's and, it's not uh, it's not, not flattering. She looks thinner, I don't know, in the painting. Uh, well let's just say she's elongated. Yeah. yeah she's uh she's quite uh 
quite um, a poor scene, and I would say not because of her size, but because of her complexion. It looks yeah, like yeah. it looks like pig skin. She's got a pinkish hue. So she went from zero <laughs> on Google. After the news broke, search interest picked up with Gina Reinhart hitting peak popularity two days later. Australia and New Zealand were the top two regions searching Gina Reinhart, but interest in the drama went global. <laughs> Austria, Ireland, and Slovenia are now interested in seeing what Gina Reinhart looks like. Her painting has been featured in media around the world, not just on the soul of Detroit. The New York Post jumped on the story. So did CNN and Mirror UK. BBC, the Hindustan Times, of course, which is a must-read for most people, along with the South China Morning we gonna, Post. Are we going to go to every country? Yeah, maybe. That's you in a hurry? Virtually, because we're at home. We're more productive. When we're sitting at home, we can go to every country. If we have to travel there, oh, we might be happy to make two a day. <laughs> Anyways, these guys all co followed coverage. <laughs> they all got in it. And then she even made it on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. Colbert said, a billionaire has called for the removal of an unflattering portrait of her. And then he said, I mean, come on. How flattering could this portrait possibly be? Then he took a look at the painting. It's awful. Unflattering indeed. Money can't buy everything. The artist said he paints the world as he sees it. Uh, Reinhardt, by the way, her fortune comes from mining. So I think it's probably inherited? fair to say that she's either inherited it, yeah. that some of the land may have been stolen from people. I wonder what, uh, I wonder what my friends from, uh, from Beds Are Burning uh, would say. Oh, uh, uh, oh, my God. Midnight Oil. Midnight Oil, Midnight Oil yes. Oil. I'm sure they have a very strong opinion about Ms. Reinhardt. Um, and I'm sure that she's left s scores of sites on Australia looking less than gorgeous, just as this artist has left her. So I wonder if her background uh, influenced his caricature. But Gina Reinhardt, we had no idea who you were. We had no idea what you look like. Now we do. And let me tell you, baby, you're our Geek of the Week. I actually don't think I would want to come to work and see Gina. She just doesn't seem like she... <laughs> I'd rather see her than that portrait. She'd be a lot of fun. But, oh, by the way, um, her website does have a portrait that she had done of her. Oh, yeah? It's very lovely. Okay, good. Not surprisingly. You get a lot of money for a billion dollars. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're in room 7609 where we, we used to look for obscure gems. We used to mine them like Gina Reinhardt, but Sean said it didn't look so good. So we've expanded our horizons. So we're looking for your favorite deep cut, your favorite tune that you think people should know about. And we always want your story too. And Todd checks in with a great story. He says, Soul of Detroit continues to pump out great content and many laugh out loud moments. Dope hookers and pavement is a quote from Detroit's own John Brannon. Brandon was describing Cass Corder in the early days of the Detroit hardcore punk scene, 1981 to 1982, when he fronted the band Negative Approach. Negative Approach played the notorious Cass Corridor neighborhood, which was when considered one of the worst neighborhoods in the city at that time. Now it's kind of been rebranded as Midtown and is very she-she. Mm. Dope Hookers and Pavement is also the name of a music doc that tells the Detroit story of the hardcore punk scene. John Brannis famously appears on the set of the October 31st, 1981 Saturday Night Live performance of the punk band Fear. You can oh, see wow, John yeah. slam dancing and sporting a fresh mohawk haircut given to him by John Belushi. Fear was banned from SNL after the performance. John Brandon went on to front the very successful post-hardcore band Laughing Hyenas, which was around from 85 to 95. The Hyenas were Ann Arbor-based, but continued to play the Detroit area and nationally. The Hyenas put out some great records during time when there was lull in the Detroit music recording industry. This was before the rise of the garage rock scene brought about bands like the White Stripes. The Laughing Hyenas were worshipped by the likes of Nirvana and the Seattle grunge scene. After a concert, John Brandon introduced Kurt Cobain to the Laughing Hyenas, then record producer Butch Vig. Hmm. Vig produced the Laughing Hyenas' first three records, 
Shortly after the Cobain introduction, Butch Vig went on to the produce went on to produce Nevermind and Nirvana. Wow, that's yeah, a, I think he played in Garbage and a couple other bands too. Really? Yeah. Okay. I think so. Mm-hmm. Well, before this gets ponderous, <laughs> everyone loved the Laughing Hyenas, but the music industry considered them toxic. Heavy drug use and crimes made them untouchable with record labels, and eventually they denied themselves any future success. Todd says, that's why my selection for Room 7609 is from the Laughing Hyenas. It's a little ditty they call Stain. So I, I really like Todd, and Todd's a supporter of the show. So I, 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 hate, <laughs> I hate to contradict him. You didn't like the song. Well, he says we could have Room Seven Six Zero Nine history made with this song selection. I think it's safe to say that I've connected at a musical level with Scratch Acid, loving Sean Windsor like no other listener. Huh. I've included comments from Sean about two of my previous song entries. 
It is rare to get Sean Windsor to say anything positive about Room 7609, <laughs> let alone dance in his chair. Most times, the only thing Sean is doing in his chair during Room 7609 is leaving it. <laughs> I, I hope he sticks around to comment and completes the trifecta. So, so sure. Todd is, has given us some examples. He says, on January 19th, 2021, when he suggested damaged goods by Gang of Four, he quotes me as saying, so this is something you're not going to hear me say very often. Sean is cooler than me. Sean says, that song was tight and energetic, like you used to be. Oh. So that's that's example one of Sean liking Todd's nomination for Room 769. Here's the other one. November 16th, 2021. Reptile by the church. Mark oh, Fellhauer. Like, yeah. Tell me about the church because I don't know them at all. I'm embarrassed. Even Sean was dancing around. <laughs> Sean, that was my favorite song in the 80s. Huh. Mark. <laughs> Seriously. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Sean, absolutely. That was the first time in two years on this podcast where I've kept my headphones and turned them up as loud as they could go. <laughs> what a jerk. So Todd says, based on these last two nominations, Room 7609, it's a done deal that, that Sean's going to love the laughing hyenas and stain. So I have mixed feelings. Uh-oh. Oh, Uh-oh. Okay. Let him down gently, Sean. Well, no, I appreciate it, Todd. I have mixed feelings. And, and it's I'm trying to separate my personal experience with uh with the music you know brandon's vocals are and that wasn't even a great example of i mean it's a good example but it's not i mean he his throat he's sort of screaming his dad was a preacher and he taps into that sort of uh mountain-esque fundamentalist stuff snake his, handling and, yeah, uh, and congregation his, and his music that's got a lot of power to it um the rhythm section the the guy plays the bass we used to wear an amish style beard and come in and i'd make hash browns for him and he was a haughty little fellow back then, and so oh, kind of a bully. He used to pinch no, people's no, asses. he just he carried himself <laughs> like a lot, of, like a lot of us do when we're in our early twenties, and so on and so forth. And I was always respectful. I, I, I knew him a little bit. The bass player didn't know as much. He's the younger brother, the the diver, uh, uh, Kimball, who was oh yeah, Bruce Kimball, uh, Olympian, yeah, 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 and just had a lot of power to him. And the and the guitar player, Larissa. Is was always really interesting, and, and I felt bad. You know, she died of an over I want to say an overdose, but she died I don't know close to twenty years ago, and she was really interesting and talented. But but the mixed feeling part comes in is one of my closest friends now ended up poaching their rhythm section and turned it into a band called Mule, not um, Government Mule. And he, Preston, my bud, who was in a band at the time called Wig, actually, and they may have even toured with the Hyenas. So I got to know a little bit of the Laughing Hyenas through Preston, who ended up taking the bass player in the, the rhythm section, essentially, and form a mule, and they used to practice on Gas Corridor. I used to go down and listen to them jam and practice. But I went to an Urge Overkill concert one time at the Heidelberg. This is back before they were... Cato Nash! Yeah, they had played... Uh, they, were, they had a song in a movie that made him a little bit bigger. I'm trying to remember that movie. Yes, it was uh, in the late late 80s. Sister Havana or something. Or, no, no, I can't Not remember. Not Hey Jealousy. That was somebody else, right? Oh, that was it. Was it Pulp Fiction, even? Uh, it, it, it was It was like Tarantino-esque. Yeah, it, was it, around it, that it may time. have been. It may have been Pulp Fiction, but I went to, and I went, and, and Ann and I weren't married at the time, and I went to this show, and Urge Overkill was the headliner, and, and Preston, and some of the high, they were all there. They did, um, Girl, you'll be a woman soon. Yeah, that was Pulp it. Fiction. That, yeah. that yes, was it. They that covered it. it, but they had their own original tune. And mind. you know, and the hyenas traveled with. Uh, they toured with uh, Sonic Youth and so forth. But I remember going, and all of a sudden, I was, uh, you know, I was just a struggling writer at that point, and and so not really cool. Not that I've ever been cool, but n nobody would. Uh, they acted like they didn't know me, right? Because they had stepped up in sort of hip coolness scene on that whole scene, and I just thought. Plus, I got to. I remember going over to, to the hyenas' house a couple times with Preston, and just the whole scene, whatever the heroin chic and the squatting down in Detroit, and oh, I'm cool. I live in Detroit. It was a very, it was a thing back then that was very different than it is now. So, so I am trying, Todd, to take out my personal experiences when I was young, trying to figure out who I was. Ponderous, man, and, it's um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the music is is interesting. There's no question, and they and they and they had a lot of fans. There you go. I did like Urge Overkill. They did have one of the coolest band logos ever. 
It was just oh, a, a very stylized yeah. U and O. It and kind the, of had and like the, it, and the it was coming yeah. at you, right? You know? Yeah, yeah. No, the Heinies were really, they were interesting and they were they were influential and they had a lot of power. Larissa Strickland, I, or that wasn't her original name, she, but Larissa was voted, I think, by Rolling Stone as one of the top couple hundred guitarists ever. She was really, she was a, a, a force in her own right. He's letting you down easy, Todd. I don't think he liked it. Yeah. But he knows. Oh, I do. I, I do. It just takes me back to a time when, you know, when you're young and you're worried more about appearance and all that. And I and I always felt that with some of that scene and that music. So sorry, Todd. But they are they, they are interesting for sure. Leave it on that, Todd. They are interesting for sure. Boy, when when Sean gets interesting on I something, know. he can really go. He's uh, kind of kind of. Yeah, as soon as I saw you pull up the Laughing Highness, I thought, oh, damn. Finally, something on the show he was interested in. No, no, I just, yeah, no. It's... <laughs> but no, they, you, doesn't, isn't that interesting? you got a preacher's son and, a, yeah. and a, an addict and a diver's, Olympian diver's brother and then a, a guy with a red beard with no mustache pounding away on the base. That's never been a good look. Uh, Lincoln. Lincoln carried it off. <laughs> Nobody since. And he was... It, it, Tight with Mort Crims. It was also there were all sorts of weird son. There were all kinds of weird connections back mm. in those days. But yeah, Al Crim went to my high school. He was a couple years older than me, and he was involved in possibly one of the greatest high school pranks of all time. I think they got the frame of some wrecked car up on the roof of the high school, which was like I don't know, fifty feet in the air. Pretty. You know, it's funny. You no, know, I talked to Preston about that. Uh, at one point, and he's like, ah, we were young, whatever. But anyway, the, the rental car story with the jacket. Yes. So I was leaving dinner with Preston. The you guy, didn't eat by yourself? The oh, really? Who, the guy who took, oh, he and funny. I were in, in Venice having a meal together. And uh, he's a, a teacher now. He still tours a little bit here and there. He's, you know, got a mostly a one-man show. But but that's who I was with that night, that that happened with the rental car jacket. It was him. The guy who stole Laughing Hyenas, uh, I shouldn't say stole, but who poached Laughing Hyenas rhythm section. Damn! Did you guys discuss that? Was he still feeling guilty about it? No, no, no. Oh, but I no, I told he got me, over it. No, no, no. Yeah, Anne was like, uh, she didn't suffer any of that back then. She's like, ah, eh, you know, you got to be real. You got to be real, right? And you know how it was. You're young, and you probably went through some of some of that, some of your shows, and your whole new wave affect, and uh, running all over England, pretending you you're not from America. I don't know, whatever, right? You you I, probably had some of that in your background. No, I just I stayed home, uh, played Atari, <laughs> and sent telegrams to people because I was more productive. <laughs> Wait, Atari and telegrams? Okay, yeah, that's that was okay. the uh, that was the eighties <laughs> yeah. version of Sean's dream workplace, you know. And occasionally someone would come by and pinch me and bully me. It was kind of terrible. So it was, you know. <sighs> Good times, good times. So uh, that's Room 7609. We love to get your nominations. You can send them to us. And remember, it has to have a story at uh, mlsoulofdetroit at gmail.com. So please keep them coming. Uh, this week, we would like to thank, and this is one of these, okay, quick, we're done, our donors. No one donated to us at the website where you can hit the PayPal or the Venmo button. And we have no new members of the Soul Patrol Folks, I have to tell you, more and more, uh, as sponsors are harder to come by, we rely on you to support this show. We have a lot of people who I know appreciate what we do, like to be part of this community, because we are very interactive. We, we like to connect with you, even if it is, I guess, kind of remotely, uh, in our own way. And for as little as five bucks a month, you can support the show. You get the show before anybody else. It posts to you before it posts to the public. You don't have to listen to those annoying insertion ads. And you can watch the show... And you can see Gina Reinhardt as she is and as she's depicted <laughs> in the National Gallery of Australia. And lots of other great stuff, including our video of Nutty, the water skiing squirrel, which is a reference to Sean's fascination with the furry rodents from last week's show, Detroit Cult City, if you haven't checked Wait that out. Wait a second, did that become a thing on uh, social media that, that we needed to promote the squirrel aspect of the pod? Yeah. Yes. Yes, we had uh, Mr. Just, just, Chapman saying, when, you know, I, I try and promote the show every every day on X, and I try and find a different way to do it. And for days I was getting, go with the squirrel, that's the winner. Do the squirrel tease. Just because some U of, U of M students uh, want to be friends with squirrels. 
No, because you had in a Hamas. Face, you, you they had like a face squirrels in Hamas. That's what they dig. There. You connected with a squirrel. You said you saw its soul, and you uh, well, saw yeah, your soul. I, yeah, we did. We looked at each other's eyes. So have you guys seen each other since? Or? Oh no, no, no! It was a one night deal. <laughs> a one <laughs> afternoon very, stand. How about kind. that? You know, we also talked about Anthony Kiedis last week, and the showing me your soul. That's my favorite Chili Peppers tune of all time. There you go. Show, yeah. Sentimental gentlemen are not afraid to tell you when. Isn't that just great wordplay? Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Now, of course, when he wrote that song, his girlfriend wasn't born, which we also talked Who is about. That? Who was that? Amelia Benavides Amazing Cologne. Amazing young guitar player they had, then he died. A fra- freshy. John Frusciante? Frusciante, yeah. is that? Well, he was one of them. Yeah, he's not dead. No, no, no. He replaced somebody that Hillel maybe. Slovak? Yeah, he, he replaced somebody that died. Hillel was the original guitarist. And Frusciante is the one that wrote the riff of Under the Bridge, right? That... Frusciante is like the one of the best guitarists, very that, underrated. That, that's but one of took, my favorite took, riffs ever. Under the bridge, yeah, just parts of that, yeah. Yeah, but he took over. I think it was Hillel. Um, I think that was his name, Hillel Slovak, who died. But he was an original member of the band, yeah. And then one of Sean's friends took the rhythm section before. And Flea. then they got Chad. Yeah, they had they had Tick, <laughs> and he's gone now. And then so Chad they, they ends up Flea. doing drum offs on Fallon with uh, uh, Will Ferrell. Yeah. Right? It's, well, yeah, it's, yeah. God, I'd like to get band. that band is so fucking good. I'd like yeah, to see him good. drum against Joe Piscopo, the greatest really drummer see, of all times. You really see the value of a guitarist when Frusciante had his issues and left the band, and they got uh, Dave Navarro because that album is so different and just does not sound like a Red Hot album. Hmm. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, that's a little deep okay, for sorry. me on the Chili Peppers catalog, but uh, I don't know one album to the next, but I do know what I like. Okay. Just like Gina yeah. Reinhardt. I like, I like art. Uh, for $15 a month, you get a bonus episode. We will be recording another bonus episode shortly. Uh, recent bonus episodes include Dan Wetzel's pay on to slap fighting. Slap, what is, slap, slap fight. Slap, slap fight. fighting. It's a slap oh. fight. Are you into it now, Sean? Not particularly, but it sounded, uh, you know, brutal. Another reason to go to the office. It's uh, it's uh. It's not like you wanted to get into it because it's no, so I brutal. No, I do. I do. When, when Mike's done, I do have some feedback. Oh, okay. Uh-oh. I may be getting slapped. Because it's, uh, fe- it's the feedback section, right? And you yes. can get Ask Erica is one of our other episodes. Once you become a Big Mouth Strikes Again supporter at $15 a month, you get access to all of our bonus episodes. For $25 a month, you get all that plus an autographed commie. Qua- autographed commie. Commie. You are a commie. Or the Kwame Sutra, and for sixty dollars a month, we will send you some distinctive, Total unique commie. ML Soul of Detroit gear. For you're hundred too, bucks you're a month, you're too handsome for a commie. You can come and join us. What? You can come be here. You can work with us as we work together in person with other human beings. Um, feedback: We love to hear from you. You can reach out to us. Uh, in fact, um, Matt Jennings, our old friend. Aww. Reached out to us on Patreon. He's a Patreon supporter and says, I love every intro. They're always so lighthearted and fun. Sean Windsor soothes. <laughs> soothes. I like that. Soothes. Just one word. Soothes. <laughs> you're the you're the sleuth and I'm the soother. Sean. Sean. The sleuth. And Mark is the seether. The sooth. Ah. Mark can't uh, he's a seeker. Can't, can't stop he's, this. To me he's more of a seeker. <laughs> He's a he's a low key seeker of human uh, truth and likes to get out in the world and those big calves carry him on the walk I'm of uh, of uh, yeah, salvation. I think it's I, a, it's it's a beautiful thing. He wants to work remotely so people don't pinch his calves. Exactly. That's, I understand. Or just my ooh, eyes or are just, yeah, my eyes are up here. Or just a hook. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of creepy in here. Now I wish I was remote. Um, so yeah, so Sean, you had said you had some feedback. Yeah, I do, I do. So so Mark, we, we mentioned movies earlier, and uh-huh. the, the sort of the loss of the shared communal experience. I'm totally with you on that. I I miss going to theaters for big movies where we share and so forth. But would you rather have that? Do you miss that enough? Because what's replaced that is incredible television from all over the world that you can watch with your your family and there's a couple of people at home well oh man I, you know how much i love episodic tv way way more than going to a film i'd rather have 10 episodes of something the problem is now is there's too many of them right so nobody ever watches the same thing it's hard to find somebody that's it's, watching the same thing you're watching it's hard to get watch to sugar to, to, to no did. yes did you like did you have you seen it all the way through have you seen it sean no. are you gonna watch it i'm not sure do you guys like it 
Well, I, I'm, I lo- I I'm about it. to do a spoiler alert yeah, here. I loved it. So I love it, noir. Yeah, I do too. Love noir. Fantastic. And this has the old L.A. feel, even though it's modern. With quite the twist. Is it as good as L.A. Confidential? I know uh, they're very no, different things. No, you can't compete with Curtis Hansen. That was great. Um, Reciprocity uh, is the key to every relationship. Oh. Was that from, from James, L.A. Confidential? James, yeah, James Cromwell. Oh, wow. Oh, yes, yes. You're not ready to do those things I've asked him to do, let boyo. Um, yeah, don't, don't start trying to do the right thing. You haven't had the practice. Exactly. And you know, you know what uh, Dr. Yalda would say. If you're going to join the detective bureau, use the gla- lose the glasses. I can't think of a single man in the unit who wears them. So thanks, <laughs> Dr. Y. Um, nice. And make sure when you see Dr. Yaldo that James... Let him know that James movie Crom- is James Cromwell, so, by the well, is in sugar. So good. That movie That's is right. So he good. is. Yeah. He is. So yep. should, we, should we ruin the twist? Well, Mark, if, if we? anybody wants to finish it or has started it or wants to see it, just... just I don't know, skip forward 30 seconds, go. You got okay, so seconds. here's your warning. In three, two, <laughs> one. Episode six, Going Home. Did you see that coming? No. I don't think anybody did that was watching that. And what it was was... Well, when he injected himself and said, I just want to go home, did you think that he really uh, became an alien or do you think he was just having a trip like he was oh, in no. a hallucinogenic moment? No, I thought he was an alien. Wow. Because his whole face changed. Why else would you shoot yourself up? And Well, no, no, but it could be him Imagine taking a, a narcotic Did and you, then thinking, mm, I'm a lizard now. No, no. Because that doesn't really fit the character either. That's what happened to Jim Morrison. There's <laughs> nobody more L.A. than Jimmy. Did you see the finale, though, the episode after? It? I did. I, I, well, yeah. there were two episodes after Oh, two. That. Okay, yeah. And uh, I, yeah. The, the, the twist, the other twist... I didn't. I didn't buy at the end. I, I don't know why. The murder part, or he, well, no. That his friend, who said, "Here's where you'll find her." I don't think he would help him find her if he was part of what was going on. So I did not buy mm. the penultimate okay. uh, plot twist. But when With he became Henry. an alien, yeah, that's when I was like, "Okay, this is not Philip Marlowe rewarmed. No, it was, this is something series. different." I, I just like really Colin like Farrell too. He's very oh, he's great, so good. He's so watchable. He's he's, he's always good yeah. for sure. He's good. By the way, Mike, your line, your favorite line was probably after James Cromwell shot Kevin Spacey and said, "Oh, what's your benediction? Have you a valediction, uh, boyo?" Yeah, Rolo Tomasi. Yeah. <laughs> That was whatever happened to that Kevin Spacey guy. Oh, oh, oh yeah. So, but the answer, but the, answer the he cl- saved the old Vic and feet. liked the young. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> last, <laughs> last time I saw him was in <laughs> Baby Baby Driver. Maybe he oh, was a great movie. That was that is a great movie. <laughs> I love so that movie. But so much. Mark, to answer well, answer well, the question, well, your well. feedback is episodic TV is so good that you're okay. That, I was okay. That, that with the culture has yeah. moved away from movie theaters. Well, there's no shared experience well, we with either one. Yeah. No, I would love to have both. I, I want to see Top Gun in a theater. Yeah, you do. Yeah. Uh, even if you have an 85 inch screen in your basement with surround sound, but not Top, not else. Top Gun, Maverick. Uh, yeah. I like Top Gun. No, you didn't. You hated it. Hopefully. I guess so. Then. I no, just, I'm kidding. It's, are you? I don't think you're kidding. Not really. Yeah. I don't where, think where's, you like where's Clara Hendrickson God. to help me out now? Oh, okay. Hey, Carlos Monares thinks Top Gun's much better than Maverick. So he's wrong, well, he's wrong again. So you're in lots of company. You're in good company there. <laughs> Does he think that Maverick has a shot at the Cy Young? <laughs> or did he blow that when he when he hijacked the F-14 <laughs> that was just sitting there ready to go? That column is not aging well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I saw I saw the numbers the other day. Not that we want to get on a sports baseball rabbit hole here, but Scooble's numbers are better in, in the, right now at this point in the season than Verlander's were in his MVP season. Well, imagine how good they'd be if he uh, pitched well in the first game. Yeah, right. No, oh, yeah. A blemish on an otherwise perfect record. Yeah, uh, left-hander that throws that hard. Holy smokes, yep. this dude is... This, if they could hit the ball half as hard as he throws it, we might have something. Yeah. <sighs> okay. Well, thanks think, again, Todd, for the laughing hyenas. Yeah, Todd. Jeez, <laughs> thanks for the deep dive. Jeez, oh, Pete's. Uh, next week, I sorry, think... Sorry to speak. I th- no, no, no. It's when you when you had something to say, it was, uh, it was brief, but it kept going on after that. No, it's very good, and uh, I, I, we're gonna have to chart the. Uh, we're gonna have to do like ancestry dot com for that band <laughs> genealogy from one. But now I asked you if Mule was government mule. It's not. It's a different mule. Different mule. Different, different mule. mule. Okay. You know what their name? And the was? wigs were not the Afghan wigs. No, they weren't. Okay. You know what Mule's first name was, and they didn't fly well with the record they tried. White N word. Yeah, I don't, I don't see that flying. 
Yeah, we did play Elvis Hitler a couple weeks ago, but we will not be playing White N Word here on the Soul of Detroit. It just, it's just well, they were trying to be cool back. This back what the early nineties. Yeah, that's guess. edgy. That's they were bad trying to be cool, that. and yeah, you know. So there was a. I mean, shouldn't they just go by the other term when you combine those two words together, Wigger? Oh, I mean, wouldn't that have been? I don't know. Mm. I don't know if that flies today. Though. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. The oppressed don't know. peoples of China. Yeah, you could pull up a mule song and play <laughs> it's it. It's the Uyghurs. Oh, the, oh, I'm sorry. My bad. I, it's, okay. a long, it's a long E song. Okay, sorry. sorry. It's like, now I know why people aren't that. Also spelled quite differently. <laughs> not that excited about helping out the rednecks. Yeah, maybe Turns we'll, out it's different. Maybe it's we'll have different. Preston on sometime. He's very, very interesting. If yeah, you're, if you're, he's yeah, gonna, find out where that I'll tell you what his first question is. Where's my damn jacket, you son of a bitch? <laughs> if he's if he's uh if you're interested in interesting guests, then uh, Oh then he's geez. uh wait a minute. No, I don't mean that. I don't wait mean it a that minute. way. I don't I just mean What if Preston took that jacket from the laughing hyenas? <laughs> yeah, right. Because ah, he, he like took, he took that rhythm section. He took the rhythm section. Preston. Hmm. That's another good thing about working from home. Nobody steals your shit. They, they were a power driving rhythm section. Well, there you go. Um, Todd could tell you that. I believe next week we will be joined by Rob Parker, who is launching a oh. black sports radio station. Another L.A. guy. I think, uh, I think that's our guest. He's kind of floating until they're ready to launch, so you'll have to come back next week and see. But until then, gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here with you and virtually from time to time. And Cyrus, wherever you are, why don't you just come along and take us out? Can you dig that? Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Next week, the soul of Detroit shows you the important part that telephone lines play in network broadcasting. We bring you more of the glamour, the comedy, and the tragedy that are found behind the mic. This is Mark Fellow. Speaking good afternoon, all.